So I'm trying to be as respectful of how they see these things as possible. So I enter into this study with total humility and I'm not trying to come off as uh, the final word or an expert on um, Native society studies. However, since I've been here in since 1981, I've made it a point to try to investigate and visit and understand what the Native people in California have gone through. Um, for eight consecutive years, my family planned family vacations around either in significant natural points in the California landscape or native um, areas like Modoc country and Hoopa and Karak and Yurok. And through this experience, you gain firsthand experience. So I highly recommend that as you travel through the state, travel through the state with native Californians in mind and seek out the areas historically that are significant to them and center their experience in your travel um, itinerary. Uh, today's title, There is a Connection, Racial Capitalism, Attempted Genocide and Prosperity. And I have to admit it's an ambitious title and we're gonna to try to cover, at least touch on all three of these, uh, these uh, subjects in this webinar, um, because there actually is a connection. And I'm not trying to guilt trip anyone or not, but we have all benefited from this connection. All of us here who come here, particularly if we weren't born here, um, we benefited. So there's a connection, racial capitalism, attempted genocide, and California's prosperity. California is the richest, wealthiest, and most profitable state in the United States of America. With over 40 million people, it's 163,696 square miles consists of pristine beaches, rich timber reserves, verdant valleys, fertile expanses, deserts, and snow-capped mountains. If it were a nation, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world after the United States, China, Japan, and Germany with a gross state product of over $3.2 trillion a year. It represents one seventh of the United States, $22 trillion gross domestic product. Its economy is larger than all of Africa and Australia combined, and almost as large as all of South America's. Its citizens, some, enjoy the highest standard of living in the world. It has the world's largest and most profitable corporations, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Tesla, eBay, Hewlett Packard, worth trillions of dollars. Some of the nation's richest zip codes and cities lie within California. Tiburon, Piedmont, Atherton, Los Gatos Hills, Palo Alto, Santa Monica, Brentwood. Yet, California's prosperity is not by accident. It was always rich. It was always bountiful. It was always blessed with the perfect trifecta of riches consisting of nature, people, and ideal climate. California was a paradise long before the Europeans discovered it. Before the European invasion, that is the 1500s, California had over 1 billion oak trees. Its fruit, the acorn, provided the basic grain nut of the culture, like rice, wheat, millet, corn, sorghum, oats, 
quinoa for other cultures. Acorn meal furnished California Indians with much of what they needed. Bread, filler for soup, grain protein, snacks. The acorn provided an essential food source in which the cultures could revolve and evolve. California had nearly unlimited herds of elk, deer, and sheep with plentiful fish in its rivers and abundant fowl. It was said that in the Ohlone, Kosanoan country in the Bay Area, one could just point their bow in the air and fire. The birds and ducks were so plentiful. In the centuries before Europeans arrived, California Indians inhabited a world different from the California we know today. Rivers ran undammed to the Pacific. The man-made Salton Sea and Lake Shasta had yet to be imagined and vast wetlands bordered many rivers and bays. The weather was next to ideal, moderate on the coast, no freezing ports during the winter, and not in direct line of late summer cyclones. It was earthquake country as a member of the Pacific Rim of fire, but there were no buildings or concrete to trample people when the earth shook. With between 310,000 and 1 million indigenous people speaking over 100 different languages, California's native peoples possessed a wide array of cultural practices, ceremonies, and ways of living, all depending on the environment, time of the year, and respective cosmologies. Wherever they lived, they shared a common belief that while they inhabited distinct areas, they all knew that the rivers, mountains, streams, valleys, and hills, the land was not theirs. There was a mutual understanding that the land was to be held in common, and not with just humans. The birds, animals, fish, plants, insects, fungi, and even unseen bacteria had a right to live and exist in California but the land was essential. According to Cedric Robinson, racial capitalism is the accumulation of wealth because of unequal differentiation of human value. The development, organization, and expansion of capitalist society pursued essentially racial directions. It could be expected that racialism would inevitably permeate the social structures emergent from capitalism. In the California context, this involved three things, labor, land, and legal rights of indigenous people. The riches of California are dependent on its land, and after that, various forms of free or extremely cheap labor. In both areas, including early legal battles, California's Indians were subjected to removal, enslavement, legal injustices, and a concerted attempt at genocide. Everything in U.S. history is about the land, who oversaw it and cultivated it, fished its waters, maintained its wildlife, who invaded and who stole it, how it became a commodity, broken into pieces to be bought and sold on the market. For its first two centuries of settler occupation, Spain invested little interest in Alta, California. But with Britain, the Netherlands, and Russia all showing increased interest, Spain launched the first of its 21 missions at San Diego in 1769. With the beginning mission system, the aspect of racial capitalism involving labor was instituted. Junipera Serra, the Franciscan priests leading the forced conversion of Southern California Indian people call their march up the coast a spiritual conquest. Sarah and the soldiers accompanying and protecting him were abiding by their philosophies of doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, and national origin narratives. They all essentially dictated that Europeans had a mandate from their Christian God to rule all humanity and bring it under their influence. 
Along with those white supremacist doctrines, Indian people were forced to build the missions, forts or presidios, and pueblos. They worked as cooks, carpenters, nursemaids, cowboys, laborers, farmers, tended animals and fished for the mission. They were enslaved. From the very beginning, Indian people were subjected to abuse, beatings, rape of women and children, death from disease and murder. Through mistreatment, overwork, disease and murder, the Indian population from 1769 to 1846 dropped from 310,000 plus to 150,000. But they still had one advantage. They knew the land and could often escape to the interior or mountains. They outnumbered non-natives 20 to one. But this was about to change. In April, 1846, under the pretext of being threatened by a large gathering of Wintus, Army Captain John C. Fremont and well-known mountain man and guide Kit Carson led a party of 71 soldiers and seven Indian allies who ruthlessly killed between 150 and 700 people, including elders, women, and children. An eyewitness wrote, the settlers charged into the village, taking the warriors by surprise, and there commenced a scene of slaughter which is unequaled in the West. The bucks, squaws, and papooses were shot down like sheep, and those men never stopped as long as they could find one alive. Those who ran were chased and killed. Kit Carson and the Delaware Indians who were with Fremont followed those who took to the plains and being mounted, they literally tomahawked their way through the flying Indians. The rest of the party stationed themselves on the bank of the river and kept up a continual fire on the Indians who had gone into the river and were swimming across. It was a slaughter. This would become a familiar pattern. With the influx of white settlers, the entire ecosystem of California Indians was disrupted. The cattle and sheep ate vital grasses normally used by wild game, and they themselves were increasingly killed. When an Indian out of hunger stole a calf or a horse, the response would be exponentially out of proportion. Their fears and biases honed by the Eastern treatment of African slaves and the Southeast Indians decimated by the Trail of Tears prejudiced the whites against Indian people before they had even met any. They viewed them as animals. While many Indians were killed by whites between 1846 and 1848, it was sent into overdrive when a bright, shiny, soft metal, gold, was discovered by Maidu Indians working for James Marshall on January 24, 1848 in Coloma at John Sutter's mill. Indian people had known about the shiny gold medal for generations. They attached little value to it. Sea seashells were their form of currency. The owner of the mill, John Sutter, was an Indian agent known as an unfair, mean slave master. Similar to how African slave children in the South were fed, Sutter fed the Indians he had coerced and forced to work in a trough like the pigs. The discovery of gold initiated a panic unrivaled in world history. Although Sutter tried to silence his workers, word immediately spread all over the world. The 48ers and 49ers came from Africa, Europe, South America, and Asia, particularly China. And they came from all over America, the East, Midwest, and the South. With them came their previously formed views of Indians, all negative, and their history of accepting and benefiting from African-American slavery. Even their derisive term for California Indians, diggers, was a take on the pejorative nigger, 
a term long used and fashionable for hundreds of years and derogatory for African Americans. They even often referred to the Indians as black. They were seen in many respects as less than e the enslaved African Americans, definitely in monetary value. A California Indian during the years up to 1865 was worth between $35 to $200 for their de facto ownership, whereas an African American slave could bring as much as $1,500. This too was a factor of racial capitalism because the whites did not inherently value Africans over Indians. It was because cotton was in great demand and brought high prices in Britain. It was all about profit and capital gain. Initially, there were up to 4,000 Indian miners working in various capacities. Some worked under slave-like conditions, while others were paid wages, and some even had claims of their own. But once the multitudes of whites flooded in, over 200,000 in four years between 1848 and 1852, the Indians were driven away from the minefields. With their entire ecosystem turned upside down, there was few wild game to hunt because grazing cattle and sheep were overgrazing and the streams were increasingly polluted due to mining. So there was little fish as well. With their way of life disrupted and European adopted means of making a living, mining, limited, many Indians began to raid and steal neighboring cattle just to survive. Whenever this occurred, the Euro-American whites would kill several Indians immediately. And it would not matter which Indians they killed. They felt any Indian would do. They believed a good Indian is a dead Indian. When the Indians retaliated and killed one or two or several whites, they would respond with overwhelming force and embark on an organized massacre. California, more than any other state or territory, participated in a full attempt to a totally eliminate Indian people. Their battle cry was exterminate them, and it received support from the state governor on down to the everyday citizen. In fact, it was formulated using democratic processes involving petitions, signatures, and votes. Because gold mining often didn't pan out as expected, many of the new settlers switched their focus to other potential and less arduous ways of making a living. They opened up stores, began raising horses, cattle, and sheep, and started farming. All of these ventures had one thing in common, the need for land. But there was just one problem. There were still thousands of Indians inhabiting much of the land, particularly the inland areas and mountains. White Americans wanted it all. They used every slight provocation and flimsy reason to launch an attack on usually defenseless Indians. The Klamath River Massacre, Sutter Butte's Massacre, and the Temecula Massacre all occurred in 1846. In February of 1849, near Sutter's Mill, up to 40 Indians were killed on the pretense of a murder committed by one of their members. This was, at the time, the largest mass execution of Indians under U.S. rule in California. In March of the same year, 1849, Mexican miner Antonio Cornell and Californio rancher Sisto Berriessa killed dozens. Cornell later wrote, at the first light, they surrounded the village and opened fire. What followed was a scene of utter horror. Out came old men, women, children, everyone, running in every direction, even throwing themselves in the river. They were all rounded up and shot down. The 
The Clear Lake Massacre in 1850 came about as a result of Pomo Indians killing Andrew Kelsey and Charles Stone, who had murdered and brutalized them for years. In retaliation, Captain Nathaniel Lyons organized a party that killed over 300 Pomo. In 1851, over 300 Wintu were killed in Old Shasta Town. The Wintu suffered again in 1852 at the Bridge Gulch Massacre, which killed over 150 people. And in the Round Valley Settler Massacres between 1856 and 1859, over 1,000 Yuki people were killed. In three successive massacres in 1853, in far northwestern California, near Oregon, the Hawanquet, the Yantuket, and the Archulet massacres killed 70, 450, and 150 Talawa, respectfully. The pain and suffering of those killings reverberate today in Del Norte County. This same murderous pattern was repeated for 27 years, 1846 to 1873. Millions of dollars was reimbursed for Indian scalps and heads. In fact, it was only white Americans who took scalps in, America, in California. While it was called extermination in the local press of the day, especially the Alta California, today it would be classified as genocide. Coined in 1943, the aftermath of the Jewish Holocaust by legal scholar Raphael Lemkin his definition was accepted by the United Nations in 1848. Genocide is defined as acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. It includes killing members of a group causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. This definition describes exactly what was attempted in California. The citizens, public and elected officials, the press, volunteer militia, governors, federal officials, and the US Army were all to different degrees complicit in the attempted genocide of California's native people. Their numbers went from 150,000 to 30,000 in those three decades. By 1900, there were only 16,000 left. Yet, there was always Indian resistance, even during the Spanish occupation. The Cachin people drove them out temporarily in 1781. They killed 11 whites in 1850 in a failed attempt to drive them away from the Yuma area. For this, they were severely punished and killed. The Modoc, whose homeland in Northeast California near present day Rairica, battled the state militias and federal government for over 22 years, from 1851 to 1873, culminating in the Modoc War. The Modoc had been fighting off and on for 20 years, when in the fall of 1872, they resisted removal from their homeland one last time. For the next eight months, the Modoc engaged, outwitted, fought, and killed U.S. infantrymen with over 400 soldiers needed to finally subdue them. They used the lava beds left by extinct volcanoes to wage an effective guerrilla war campaign. They eventually had to surrender but it cost the United States government over $417,000. Its leader, Knit Toth, 
and three others were hanged and their heads severed by the military tribunal in 1873. With the Indians nearly killed off, the state and federal government turned their focus to Indian children, forcibly removing thousands in California and the Midwest to culturate them for assimilation. These started with the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania in 1873. At one point, there were 122 boarding schools and over 200 day schools around the country. Their slogan was, kill the Indian, save the man. When a starved, frightful, and alone Indian man, a Yahi, later named Ishi, turned up in Oroville in 1911, he was hailed the last wild Indian of California. Public anger had turned into voyeuristic racism by then, and everyone wanted a glimpse of the last Yahi. Ishii was transported to San Francisco and became a living museum installation, working with Alfred Kroeber, University of California, Berkeley, sole anthropologist. Ishii lived only four years in captivity and impressed everyone with his graciousness, kindness, an impressive knowledge of survival, tool making, and culture. His rendition of the wood duck story alone took six hours to tell, and it was just one of dozens he shared. Sadly, he contracted tuberculosis and died after the Pan American Exposition of 1915, when he was exposed to the public at large. Attempted genocide led directly to California's prosperity. California's prosperity is directly related to the land, its weather and geographical features. But Native Californians were on the land. In the minds of Euro-Americans, they had to be removed. The Los Angeles and San Francisco Bay Area gross metropolitan products of $1 trillion and $907 billion, both outrank 16 nations. And Los Angeles is the third worldwide after Tokyo in New York. Los Angeles sits on Chumash and Tongva land. The entire Bay Area is on Ohlone or Costa Noan land, including Silicon Valley. The University of California established itself at first around mining Indian land, then legitimized itself as a bona fide university based on its ethnographic studies, beginning with Ishii. Stanford University, sitting also on Ohlone land, was begun with a $20 million gift from its namesake, Leland Stanford. Stanford had made much of his fortune on real estate stolen Indian real estate. And as governor, he sanctioned mass killings. Many of the most recognizable place names before 1900 and European and many Spanish are names of people who directly indirectly participated in the attempted genocide of California's native people. Hastings Law School in San Francisco is named after Serranus Hastings who, as an assembly legislator, helped sponsor Walker Jabot's 1859 Eel River Rangers Massacre. Vallejo, California is named after Indian killer Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, and the land was Ohlone land. Fremont is named after notorious Indian killer, U.S. Captain John C. Fremont, and Carson Pass, and nearby Carson, Nevada, named after the infamous Kit Carson. Kelseyville, California, is named for Andrew Kelsey, who killed Indian people for fun. His death resulted in the Clear Lake Massacre. 
The length and breadth of the state is littered with stories of disaster. And on top of that disaster, there is wealth. There's a plaque in the Northern California city of Weaverville noting a large picnic hosted by local whites inviting the Indians to eat. They feasted and died of mass poisoning. Despite the tragedies, attempted genocide, kidnappings, and stolen children, present day California, native California still lives. There are over 150,000 Indians again. And each year, legal battles are increasingly restoring some Indian land. In Humboldt and Del Norte counties, the Yurok, Karak, and Hoopa still inhabit parts of their traditional homelands and number in the thousands. Yet, a huge debt is owed the Indians of California. In many respects, all non-Native people today are still indirectly gold diggers. We're after some form of economic gold. And the first step in atonement is acknowledging that harm has been done. It is only in recent years have scholars begun seriously reviewing California's murderous past and telling the truth. The state was founded on the attempted genocide of its Indians by you Americans after the wealth of its land, people, and resources, including gold. The second step is the intentional centering of native Californians in the policies, platforms, and agendas of legislators, academia, and philanthropy. The third step includes some form of reparations and restitution decided and controlled by Indian people. While it would not resurrect lost souls and kill the loved ones, it would establish an economic foundation for the descendants of that time and began the path of some kind of reconciliation. This webinar is dedicated to Ishi, the thousands of murdered, raped, and kidnapped Native Californians and their proud descendants still living and revitalizing their cultures throughout California today. This is a selected bibliography. There's a lot of books, but there are not a lot of books that really honestly deal with the genocide of Native California people. It's only been in the last 15 years or so that a certain group of scholars have attempted to go on and, and right the wrongs of the historians. Um, I highly recommend first reading uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Uh, she's part native herself and she writes from an inside position. And her book, Indigenous People's History of the United States, is kind of patterned after Howard Zinn's uh, history of, you know, uh, of people of the United States. And it, it is a broad, comprehensive work. But she goes into quite a bit of detail on the ideological and philosophical foundation that was laid that made it justifiable to take so-called Indian land in the sense that um, Manifest Destiny, their doctrine of discovery, uh, John Locke's uh, ideas on property, they utilize these things because as you see, American society at this time was trying to be uh, a democracy and it was trying to consider itself uh, using laws to guide its actions. So it needed laws and certain legal justification to justify, at least in their minds, the open killing of Indian people. As we look at it now, we see the flimsy arguments that were laid out and we can just riddle through all of those doctrines, whether it's manifest dectory, destiny or doctrine of discovery or any of that, because we basically see it as Eurocentric white supremacist thought. But at the time, that criticism and that level of inquiry had not uh, attained, been attained by indigenous and oppressed people. So I highly recommend people to do their own study the documentary film, uh, Ishi, The Last Yahi, is very informative. 
it's painful film, but it's very important to look at. Um, Clifford Trancer and ha uh, Joel Heyer's book, Exterminate Them, is just incredibly painful to read because they actually utilize the articles that were written. Now, while there were a few articles that were trying to defend the Indians, the overwhelming majority were totally in support of killing them outright. And when you read this, and these are people who consider themselves Christians and good people, uh, nice even, you know, how they could treat other people this way is a lesson in history. And the first thing you do to justify eliminating a people is that you debase them. You compare them to animals. You reduce them from the level of humanity because of course, no one wants to be considered a killer of humanity. So you delegitimize their humanity. And then based on that delegitimization, you authorize yourself to kill them. And we've seen this in genocides throughout history, whether it was the Nazi genocide against Jewish people. You even see it within people from our perspective look alike in the sense of Rwanda. You had the Hutus and the Tutsis. And looking from the outside, you would say like, well, why is one group of these people killing the other? Well, it's because of the British colonialism favored one group and told them because they had more aquiline features that they were better than the other group. And this through generations made that group who were favored by the British think they were superior. And when they got the opportunity, they launched that. Yet, when we look at Rwanda, they have also been the model for reconciliation. I've seen documentaries where a man is sitting next to a woman and both of her hands are cut off. And it was that man who cut this lady's hands off. And a part of their reconciliation process, he took it upon himself to dedicate the rest of his life to being the hands of this woman. And they sit together and they don't live as husband and wife. He's basically her servant. So that does give hope that if the truth can be admitted, you have a foundation then for truth and reconciliation. But that has never been attempted in the United States. There's never been attempted to reconcile the wrongs done in African-American slavery, Indian attempted genocide. And we do say attempted genocide because we don't want to give the impression that they were successful because they were not. There are over 5 million Indian people in the United States today. In fact, they have the highest birth rate. So they failed in their attempt at genocide, but they were successful in their attempt in terms of underdevelopment and oppression. And we see this will to live all over the world. The Rohingya people in Myanmar who are linked to the indigenous people of that society, they are being hunted down and driven off by the Burmese or the Myanmar people, primarily because of that ancient link and that tad bit of Africanity that they have. So these are problems that we see all over the world and that if there's going to be any substantive change here in the United States, the truth has to be told, the truth has to be admitted, and then we have to take concerted steps and actions to correct these wrongs. And that is not all on the people who've been impressed themselves. This is on the people who have been the oppressor. And what we see right now in our nation is literally what Malcolm said, the chickens are coming home to roost in America. America's hate and violence and its foundation based on violence is coming to fruition. And it's haunting itself because basically you have a nation that's almost at civil war at this point. And that's because the people who waged the civil war and the Confederacy never admitted any wrong. When General Lee surrendered 
He only said that they lost because the North had more firepower and more people. Not once did he say we were wrong for instituting slavery. We were wrong for causing an uprising, a treasonous uprising in our nation. So until some wrongs have been admitted, and in this case, by the ruling powers in California, the people, the ruling families of California, when I was in Del Norte County, it was painful to hear Yurok and Karak people discuss the fact that amongst them to this day are descendants of the people who had killed their people in the Talawa massacres 150 years ago. They still interacting with these people. And those people and those families in Del Norte County are still in control in a lot of ways. So I will end here. And this is just a snapshot. This is a vast, vast subject. And I encourage people to do your own study. Don't accept anything that I say at face value or anyone. Do your own homework. Uh, if you want to reach me, this is where I am. And um, thank you for your time. Ashamed.